And then finally we have uh, Alicia Cervera Clemmerich. And uh, she's a managing partner at our family firm. Today she oversees $4.5 billion of real estate, pre-construction and general real estate. And uh, there's even an Alicia Cervera Day, uh, which is October 18th, designated by the city of Miami. Now, now it's for her mother, but that just shows you the importance of the firm. Um, okay, so, Ron, I want to ask you a question first. Um, tell me what you're seeing in the month after Hurricane Irma. You mentioned that in terms of contracts, it was down 50% for the month of September. Um, you know, when are we going to get back to normal? What's the situation for October? Well, the first thing that uh, we all noticed when Irma had passed is uh, it was uh, it was a very disruptive storm, more disruptive than destructive. And by that, I mean that we just didn't have a whole lot of uh, property damage, uh, had a lot of landscape damage, and of course, people were just uh, pulled off uh, the sidelines. Uh, in our company's case, we closed our offices on Thursday and Friday before the storm, and then we all watched the storm go through over the weekend. And we didn't have power in some of our offices for about two or three days. And so we really didn't get back to work until sometime the next week. And then by the time everybody got back home from wherever they had taken off to, uh, it was a couple of weeks that we just didn't have anybody doing anything. You know, buyers were gone, the sellers were gone, the realtors were gone. So consequently, when you tallied up the numbers at the end of September, uh, we had about a 50% decrease, not only in sales, but a 50% decrease in the number of new listings that we normally would have seen in September and a 50% decrease in the pending sales. So the closings, the pendings, and the new listings all were off about 50%. I checked this morning and uh, October is running about 17, 18% behind last year also. Uh, obviously we expected that, I'm not alarmed by that. You know, many of our sellers, uh, we have about 800 properties in the MLS that were taken off the market temporarily. Uh, the sellers said, look, I just don't want people coming to my house right now. I can't get out of my garage because there's a big tree across the driveway or whatever. Most of that's been cleaned up now, and it's every day looking better and better. So, um, that's right. Where are you guys seeing similar things? Nancy, how about your firm? Um, we did. We took a hit in September. There's no question that we did. And we also took a hit in inventory. But interestingly enough, in, in October, we're trending ahead of the year before. We expected that, you know, things weren't going to get cranking again until November. But as it turns out, you know, I think that that demand is there, and I think it's a pent-up demand. So I think... You know, our predictions are those that, that didn't, you know, choose to buy back in September, they still want to, and they're coming back in. You know, the, the same number of buyers, in my opinion, exists in the marketplace at all times. They're just different sometimes. They're investors, sometimes they're an end, you know, user. They're just different characters, but they're there. I'm gonna jump in and say something real quick. Also, I think uh, one of the things that also happened is that internationally, and people who are not from Miami, got a lot of bad press about this storm. You know, they, there was a, a video clip that went on about right in front of uh, Jane that there was a lot of water and brickle streaming and every single social media, like if that was a scenario all throughout South Florida, and it wasn't. There's a lot of buildings like where I live where we didn't lose cable, we didn't lose internet, we didn't lose power. And that message was really not sent out um, to the communities. And everybody, I got so many messages saying, hey, we're so sorry for you, we're sorry for everything that's happening. Like there's nothing happening. Like not in the perspective that people thought it was happening. And, uh, and we really, you need to get that message out there. Yeah. I think it's really hard to tell if you're not actually here. Um, my, my other question is, how far off are prices from the peak of the market at this point? Um, you, some anecdotal examples, you see like a Faena house, it was trading at a 25% discount. Um, is that kind of where the market's at compared to peak? I, I just want to talk for one second about Arma. I think we have to look at cases of natural disaster, attacks, and understand that they're unique in nature. Um, it was it was somewhat ironic that September 11th fell around the same date as Irma, and I remember in New York City after September 11th, as tragic as it was, prices were slashed, people were scared, but very, very quickly the market bounced back. During the hurricane, before the hurricane and immediately after the hurricane, we were receiving calls, which to me is an indication of strength in the market. And the calls were coming from domestic buyers, and the calls were coming from international buyers asking about opportunity. They were quick to see how quickly they could capitalize on this unfortunate event, which thank God we were blessed by. 
as Ron said, destructive and disruptive instead of destructive. But ultimately, it indicated to us that the demand for South Florida is robust, is strong, is sincere, and that combined with the value proposition of South Florida makes us a target for opportunity. So I expect that there will be a spillover from the disruptive part of Irma into the fourth quarter, and ultimately, I think year over year will be strong. At Element, we're growing so quickly that ultimately our numbers continue to grow in strength, so it's hard for us to judge from an Element perspective. But there's no doubt the, fourth, the third quarter was, was traumatic for all of us. As it relates to values, um, ultimately I think the market cannot be categorized as one anymore. There are so many different pockets in this market. We can look at each part of the market separately. Obviously, inventory is going to affect prices. As inventory increases, prices are going to decrease. But the reality is we are seeing most of the new inventory in the most heavily in general, inventory markets has been built. So there are about 5,600 condos that have been built and have been come to market. So about 5,100 yet to be built. And frankly, they're gonna get be less and less delivered over 17, 18, and 19. So the developers were smart. They prepared themselves, they're not overbuilding, and we're gonna have an opportunity to see that inventory fly. Obviously, there are sectors of the market. You mentioned Faena, where we saw the highest price points ever in <coughs> South Florida history. Some of those buyers decide, hey, I'm not gonna build it, I'm not gonna finish it, and they're just gonna slash. So can you generalize and say Miami Beach, new condos in general are down 25%? What, what sort of benchmark? Total, I think Miami Beach, certain pockets of Miami Beach, new condos are down up to almost 30%. Other buildings or inventories are around 10%, the, the prices aren't as, aren't as low. But ultimately, there's not as much desperation as there once was. Um, buyers are strong in their investments. It's probably gonna take us another 12 to 24 months for prices to reach their peak. Have any of you other guys seen any price cuts that have been, you know, a wow moment for you? I, I know that Louise Sunshine just dropped her price on her, her condo, and she should know a thing or two about pricing. 45% since 2015. Maybe she overpriced it at the beginning, but what, what does that say to you? Well, there was no baby in, the, in, there, in that thought, but I, I also want one more thought on Irma because I think it's important. Uh, a, a very positive message that went out from Irma is how well the city and the state responded. Where other places were not able to respond as effectively and as quickly, we got all kinds of kudos for responding incredibly well. And for our clientele, a lot of it being foreign, they said, wow, it's just one more reason to come over to the United States. That power army of electricians that came in, how quickly the city cleaned up, and what a phenomenal job all of you, all of us did, getting out the message that Miami's still standing. So that was, I think, a, a very big positive that came out, and also great pride in the realtor community, particularly how we came together to help each other in the communities in need. It was a wonderful spearheaded effort by a lot of you sitting in this room, and it was unbelievable to me that within two days they were saying at some shelters, we've got enough stuff, please don't keep it coming. So that was, a, I think, a positive, and I think we're gonna see a big bounce in the season because tragically a lot of places that people would have traditionally gone to may not be as appealing. And I know that I'm already hearing from my clients, get ready because you're gonna have a huge onslaught. So I do think we're gonna have a bounce back. Can I, uh, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, I agree with Alicia. We're probably gonna have, uh, we we'll probably have more pent up demand in a luxury market than we've ever had. And that's a bold statement to make, but I think that we have probably more pent up demand from people all over the world that want what we have because now they all have seen it. And but they are not willing to pay some of the current asking prices. <coughs> you know, Jay's already commented on that, and I agree. You know, every building is different, but generally, I mean, we're seeing you know some 20% uh, reductions in the original asking prices. And again, remember, we're talking about asking prices to sale prices. It doesn't mean that we really lost value. I mean, people are still making a profit in some of these cases. Now, if somebody bought, you know, when you mentioned Fayette, yeah, that was a for real loss. Paid 16 and a half million dollars sold for 12 and a half million, never moved into it. But you know, those are wealthy, wealthy people who have other reasons for buying and who knows what. But you know, generally, I'm more focused with our sellers and our associates and all of us in this room are in the same you know, business. Uh, we're more focused on helping our sellers to understand what is today's real price. If you don't want to sell at today's real price, then just take it off the market. We're fine with that. We just need to have balanced inventory. We need to have six to nine months of inventory for a balanced market. Once we go above nine months of the overall market, prices will begin to stagnate and eventually they'll begin to fall. In the over million dollar market, we can handle 12 to 18 months of inventory. 
Today in single family homes in Miami, we have about 26 months of single family inventory. Too much. We need to get the prices down some to attract these buyers. Condos, you know, we're up to almost four years of inventory in the over million dollar market. When you get up into the three, four, five, and ten million dollar condos and single family homes, you know, many more months of supply. It's all about months of supply. And I know that sounds like I'm making it too simple, but this business is not complicated. And you know, others have said that. You know, we have the buyers out there, we just need to have an attractive offering to them. And I add to what Ron was saying because um, talking about dropping the prices, one of the issues is the month of supply, right? So in Miami Beach, single family homes that are over $5 million, you have about 27 a year, but there's 100 on the market. Same thing happens to the condo. There's about 20 that sell a year over $5 million that are the resale, not counting the development sales. There's 100 on the market, right? So that's a five year supply on that bracket. You go to keep this game, houses selling over $5 million on the water, there's two that sold in the last 365 days. There's 20 on the market. That's a 10 year supply you're looking at that way. So, you know, it, it all depends because there's also a big velocity on the, on the lower number, so. So I, I have a little bit of a different thought. How many of those houses are empty? Because we all love selling stuff and we all want to sell it quickly. But I'm going to throw out a little bit of a different idea. I don't think that sales drive demand nearly as much as occupancy drives demand. And I've learned that 100% in what I do. If the units are built, you need to build more. Doesn't matter how fast or how slow they're selling. And so I would encourage all of you to look at occupancy. How many of those houses on the bay or on the ocean or whatever are not being enjoyed by anyone? My guess is 97% of them are being enjoyed because that's about our occupancy rate. And even though there's all of the supply coming online, the rents have not dropped dramatically. In fact, they've dropped very slightly and the right product continues to move. And just because like, we all want to hear good news, we launched a job um, a couple of, I think it was two weeks before the hurricane. We have over 60 um, reservations signed with deposits, even with the hurricane, even with the slowdown, even with all of that, and our velocity is increasing. And that's at kind of an entry level. It's a new class um, of product in the market because it's student housing condominiums. So it's a very unique product. And on the top, where we're selling Aston Martin, we're breaking every record, including some of our own, which I'm delighted. And and so it speaks to strength with the right product if it's being offered. What price per square foot are you seeing? Just under 100, 100,000. By the way, I also, yeah. it's, it's, it's very interesting to note, and I agree with everything that's been said, but the market is driven by sales. Okay, and for the first two quarters of 2017, since 2017, we saw increased sales velocity. Ultimately, increased sales velocity will result in a decrease of inventory, which will result in prices rising, which shows me, notwithstanding Irma and Q3, we have strong demand for our market. And I also want to comment, because I think Alicia said something that's very important. We also proved to the world that we have the gold standard for hurricane preparedness in our construction. Whether you go to Houston, whether you go anywhere else in the world, people now know that we are more prepared than any other city in the world to face issues that are not unique to South Florida. That message needs to be driven home. And the safest place to be is in a new condo. So our market is gonna to continue to thrive just like all the other major metropolitan markets across the country that are now going vertical because there is no more land. So that's a message that will res resonate with people, with buyers both internationally and domestically and ultimately will benefit our globally low price points. Do people have a lot of questions about insurance? What what, are, what questions are people asking post hurricane that are not from Miami that are buying here? Not really have a lot of questions about insurance. Interest electricity. It's, yeah, it's still it's still available. You know, I don't think that's an issue. I did want to make a comment on what Jay said. I think we're in probably one of the most price sensitive markets that I've ever seen, and it's in the individual pockets. For example, you can take a buyer out, and they're looking at a condo. And then they flip over, look at a single family home or vice versa, because so many of our condominiums now are like single family homes with a lot of the amenities. And we have to pay attention to the buyer. You mentioned the international buyer. That's huge. We have international people. We have domestic people. And I would tell you, if you're looking for business right now, go into the neighborhoods because they're buying each other's properties. They're taking advantage of that. So you have to pay attention to the buyers. If you're a strong listing agent, take out a few buyers, because if you're not paying attention to what the buyers want, we all know they want new. They want new. So any of your existing inventory better look good and better match what that buyer's looking for. Because if you listen to what they want, you'll get your property sold, not just as, as a person working with the buyer, but also the listing agent. 
the, the low end of the market is where the pressure really is. I mean, if, if we have, I tell our associates, if we get a call this afternoon on a $500,000 property, don't even ask the address, just take the listing because we're going to sell it. And that, that demand at that market under 500, and especially under 300, if you look back one year ago, 48% of every single family home in Dade County was selling under $300,000. And most people don't believe that, but if you go into the MLS, in fact, some of those sheets I passed out, you can see that. Uh, if you go uh, and look at every sale in Dade County, one year ago, 48% of the sales were under $300,000. Today, because that part of the market is just being chopped off at the bottom, we only are selling 30, only 37% of the sales, single family homes in Dade County are now under 300. Eventually, the $300,000 under price range will just evaporate, and then most people will go to condos or wherever they can find something less. We also need to look at, at not the sales comparison, but 16 and 17. 16 sales were way down about 16% from 15, and now we're down again, even though we feel like we're selling more, we're down about 7% in sales and units this year versus last year. So when you combine the two years together, we really should do more, more, we should do more comparison with the numbers that occurred in 15, because as you said, in August of 15 is when we saw this downturn starting to happen, and it hasn't really gained any steam yet to get back up in the high end. Low end is totally different. But even, I'm sorry, even uh, single family homes in Miami Beach, homes under $5 million are selling very quickly. You know, there's 200 that sold, and there's 288 that are on the market. So there's like a 17 month, in the market, so they're moving quickly as well in Miami Beach. Most of those are in that the lower end of that over a million dollar range, like in Pinecrest, the Gables. You know, from a million to two million, lots of sales. And once you pass two million, it's like wow, there's a wall there. And I know we use these days these calculations to figure out how many years of inventory we have, but if demand skyrockets, like I expect it will, because of the retirees, the baby boomers, the people that are moving here, and we just opened, we're now the second largest real estate firm in California, we have 750 agents there. Our phones are ringing off the hook because California residents want to become Florida residents so that they can save on taxes and enjoy what is clear today to be one of the most beautiful climates to live out in the country. So all of a sudden things can shift for many, many reasons and the demand increases and those inventories are absorbed like crazy. We saw it after the last bust. I heard everybody talking about it. it's a bloodbath, years and years, thousands of units of inventory and in just a couple of years they were all absorbed and now those same units are trading at a tremendous multiple to what they were bought at. What's top of the market right now? Is, is 2,500 a square foot as high as things go? I, th I think Faina sold for that. Summit uh, Porsche Tower sold for that. I mean, we're selling over $2,500 a foot at Monat Terrace at 87 Park. Um, I think that's pretty much the top, but we're seeing those numbers. So Monat, and then that's for the new project you're doing now? 2,500, no, no, uh, new deals? H uh, JDS. Um, yeah, we, we sold a high priced unit yesterday, $1,800 a foot. We sold the Pentos for $2,600 a foot. And we're seeing those numbers at 87 Park as well. Yeah, I think there's also a, a big price differential between the beach and the city. And I've been saying this for about a year now, that the differential is too high. So if you're looking with a buyer and the buyer's telling you, where's the opportunity? You know, normally we're comparing ourselves to London and Tokyo and Paris, and up. Right now, you compare yourself with Miami Beach. So you can buy at 18, 3,000, 2,600 in Miami Beach, or you can buy the same thing with a seven minute drive for half. So there's a, an interesting gap there, and I do think that, that no one thinks Miami Beach is gonna drop by 50%. So clearly the city side is gonna go up. And I don't that think that was and I, and I don't think they're the same products. I think the product that's being built on Miami Beach, the ones that I'm referring to, are vertical residences with 30, 40, 50, 60 units. I think the product that's being built downtown generally is much larger, many more units, different types of amenities, different types of finishes, still spectacular and amazing and maybe a better value proposition in the long term. But I think these projects that we're talking about, like Faena House, like 87 Park, I mean, these are, these, these are products that are costing you know, four or five hundred dollars a foot in construction costs to build. It's disproportionate to what I think is happening in the Miami market, but I do agree with you. I think the Miami market presents tremendous opportunity because years ago, no one would live in downtown Miami. Now, in downtown Miami, you don't have to leave. You have everything you want in a stone's throw, and, and it's quite frankly a much more residential domestic market than the tourist market that we see on Miami Beach. So I think it's an opportunity either way. Let's talk about advice for residential brokers out there. Um, Nancy, you, as I mentioned, coach the Jills. They're one of your team, uh, one, part of your firm. What, what do you tell them? Do they come to you for advice? Um, what I would say to you is that every single person needs a coach. You know, Tucker Woods had three coaches. 
when he was in his prime, you must have a coach. Your manager should be your first coach that you go to. If you happen to be in management, I would say go to your top producing agents and help them out because otherwise you can you can get distracted. There's a tremendous amount of interaction between the top producers and, and the managers if you want them to be effective because they're running huge businesses, but so are we. You know, if you're managing an office, you're running a larger business than they have and everything that you learn every day will benefit them. They have employee issues, they have um, you know, administrative issues, they have marketing that has to be you know, kept up to date and taken up to the next level. There's public relations, there's many components to it, and they need assistance with everything, and you're not bringing value if you don't meet with them on a regular basis. And Ron, I know you do lunch and learn sessions at your firm. Have there been any that have been particularly useful lately for brokers in this more uncertain market? Well, you know, we're, we're certainly sensitive to the fact that most of you that are out in the marketplace every day, I mean, you have the hardest part of what we do because you're out with face-to-face -face buyers and sellers, long days, hot days. You know, you need help on the marketing side, especially because marketing today is wide, a wide range of marketing from social media to the still print media, you know, newspapers and magazines and mail outs and all the different things that we do. So you know, we feel that where we can help our associates the best is to give them those tools. And once you have the tools to help them to, to utilize them, and we have more tools than people have time to even get in and, and look at. But our managers, as Nancy said, you know their their role is to help our agents, help our associates to better utilize those tools and, and produce those tools. I, I think uh, it's very important pricing, 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 and making sure that the agents are educating the people who are listing as to realistic time frames of what is being sold, how long is it taking to sell and to make sure that depending on their need of how fast they need to sell or not, that they price accordingly. And I mean, I love using Excel for that stuff. So I love going onto the MLS, downloading. I mean, I spent probably hours just studying the market on this stuff and downloading it to Excel and sending it to my customers and friends that live in certain neighborhoods so they can understand it, digest it, see what's happening. And we need to do that more and more and more. And many times when you start doing that, you start doing those studies at moments, 12 o'clock at night I'm sitting and doing these downloads, I find deals. And when you find those deals, then you go up and you call those customers that are in your backup list that, you know, that they're just looking for that deal or they, they want to move into something quickly or they would only buy if they have the right deal. Then you have a reason to call them and then you pick up the phone and say, hey, look at this Excel I did. Look what this house is selling for in comparison to all these. Look at the comps. And then use that as your tool to be able to call them and say, hey, you might want to look at this deal because right now, everybody's just sitting back. But if you pick up the phone, you call somebody and say, I got a deal for you, they're going to listen. But you better make sure that the deal's a real deal. You know what, I, I got to ask a quick question. How many of you are holding your cell phone in your hand right now? Everybody. One of the biggest mistakes I think we make in our business is that's where your business is. It's your database, it's your sphere. There's so much noise in the market. I gotta be in social media, I gotta be in this, I gotta do that, I gotta do my farm, I gotta do this. And you know, every single day you wake up and you're you're busy with things that really don't make a difference. Start with your sphere because I've been in the business for 38 years, hot flash. The majority of our business comes from your sphere. I could hand my database that's in my phone to any one of you, but you don't have the personal connection that I have to it. So it's like the white pages for you. Pick up your phone, reconnect, and then build your social media programs around your database, all your mailing programs around your database, and do an excellent job, and you'll get repeat and referral business. That's the easiest way to build and grow your business. Plus, look at your business for the last 12 months. Where did it come from? You know, if you're spending a lot of time in this particular area and it's not giving you a return, and 80% of your business is coming from your sphere, for goodness sake, spend 80% of your time on your sphere and 20% on the white noise that's going on out there. I, I also want to comment about how I think the jobs of the realtors have changed. You're now responsible for being purveyors of information, not simply driving people around in cars and showing them properties. I think the caliber of our clientele has shifted from potentially flight capital, investment property, to people that are moving here for full-time residency. The interest of those clients has changed from someone looking just to buy a condo that might have a split floor plan and a pool to someone that's looking to move their family here. You have to understand the market. Product is driving sales as much as location is driving sales. And if you don't know the different markets and you don't know the different values and you don't know the different 
uh, information related to the market, you cannot be a purveyor of information. So study the market reports. I think all of us produce very valuable quarterly reports. Yet, I wonder how many of the agents actually study those reports to be able to convey that information to their clients on a regular basis. I also believe that regular communication with your database, as Nancy said, your sphere of influence, is crucial. But don't just send them listing after listing after listing because ultimately they're not going to look at the listings. Send them information that's relevant. Interesting news articles, interesting facts about the market, data reports that, you're, that all of us prepare. And that way you become someone that they turn to for advice and you become meaningful to them as opposed to what we can find by just going online. You know, the airline industry used to have to call a travel agent to book an airline ticket. You can now go to any one of the many portals online and book your own airline ticket. Our industry is much more complicated than buying an airline ticket. But you need to know what you're talking about and you need to share that information regularly. Jay, I've got to jump in here because I was just at an international event and they gave me a statistic that really woke me up. They said that when millennials go to sell their properties, they're starting to buy. When they go to sell their properties, 50% are going to sell by themselves. Now, when you think about the value that we're going to have to bring to that group of individuals, they can do everything we can do and better. They're much better at digital marketing than we are. They understand all of that. They got virtual reality down in spades. You know, they, they have all that figured out. Think about how much value and information we need to give to our customers so that we are relevant when these millennials come along and decide to sell their homes. I mean, it's a wake-up call. And, and I think that the big differentiator is not giving the data. The data is available, they can get the data on their own. Where I believe that we really add value is interpreting the data. What does that data mean? Because there's so much information out there that people drown in it. So yes, it's important that you have the facts, but that you understand the facts and can communicate how they're important to your client and why they matter. That's what's going to keep you gainfully employed, regardless of how much public information there is. And Ron, you were saying, just in terms of pricing, that you're seeing that some brokers are pricing properties according to closed deals rather than doing it based on inventory and, and, and more forward-looking metrics. What, what, what is kind of your ideal scenario for pricing or what should brokers be doing? Well, our business is based on comparable sales. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, obviously new construction, I mean, we have a new product and it's gonna be at a higher price and we expect it to be at a higher price and so we have to sell the whole package and you know, the folks that are, that are doing that are doing a great job of that but the bulk of us in this room are working off of listings. I mean, the assets that we have in this business are our listings. And, you know, it always, you know, just kind of disappoints me when I see all the hard work that we put into something for six months, but we don't we don't educate our sellers enough. You know, we're, we're afraid to tell our seller, you know, you're really overpriced by 20%. We need to reduce the price. We just need to get bolder about that as an industry. And I mean, we can look through the industry, we can look through the recent sales and see that the, the properties that we're selling were the ones they were priced by. Now, we still have an MLS. If you go in there right now, you'll see way overpriced listings. You know, there's really no reason for us to do that other than we were afraid to tell the seller, oh, I might not get this listing. You know, we don't really need the listing if it's, if it's going to be 25% overpriced. You know, I tell our associates we should be priced somewhere 5 or 6% more than we think it's going to sell for. And we have enough data that we know what it should sell for. You know, we have enough experience in the market. Everybody in this room has that experience. You know, and we should all talk to each other more about, you know, really what is the value? When people come to look, other associates or other realtors come to look at our properties, we should ask them, you know, well, what, what do you think your buyer would pay? Let's talk about really what the value is here. Uh, because we are sitting still in the high end, not the low end. And they said the first child, second wife, third realtor. We gotta dispel that myth. We gotta be the first realtors. We gotta be the best realtors. We need to price these properties so that they will sell. That's how we make more money. That's how we do more deals. Can I add on to something to the presentation? Um, we're, we're, a lot of us are in development sales, right? So when we price a building, we create a stacking plan and price all the units in the building. I had an amazing teacher to do that. She's sitting right there. 20 years ago, she, she taught me how to price a building in no time. But nobody really does that on the general real sale market. So, when you're going to go and present to get a listing or when you're going to go to present to try to sell in a particular building, you could create an Excel with the same stacking plan to simulate the building and put all the units that are available for sale, put all the units that sold, and present that to the customer. I did that to somebody who was trying to buy 10 units at the Mondrian, and they loved it. They picked out the units that they wanted. We started making offers, and it worked great. But you could do that to any building, and it makes the presentation fantastic. If anybody wants to learn how to do it, reach out to me. I'll teach you.
I think it's really important for us to understand that we're in a partnership with a seller, just like you're in a partnership with your doctor. If your doctor tells you to knock off the salt and you choose not to do it, that partnership gets broken and then someone gets damaged and it's, it's not the doctor. I think it's also important that we deliver information and we deliver information for them to consume. For example, one of my pet peeves is we call active listings active. There's nothing active about them. They're unsold. They need to change A to U, unsold inventory. The other thing is that when it's a contract that's sold, a closed sale, that's a buyer gone. That should be a BG. We don't have that buyer anymore. There's nothing we can do about it. And then the expired did not sell or DNR, do not resuscitate. Take it the way you want. I mean, it's done. It's gone. There's nothing left on it. And then one more, which I think is the most important thing, and I think Ron was alluding to it, the most contemporary information we have is pending sold. That's your strike zone. That's where the buyers are hitting. Doesn't matter what they sell it for, it doesn't matter what they close it for, right then and there, and we don't put it in there. And please, put it in front of the seller, like a buffet or a menu, and work with them as a partnership to come up with a price. Because if you give a price, I assure you, you're dead wrong, unless you got a check and you're ready to buy it yourself. Because the buyer determines the price. We don't determine the price, we never have. So when you give them that number, they're gonna hang you with it. So give them the information, and in your partnership with the, the seller, you just kinda shake your head. Don't think so. You know, eh, yeah, it's not quite there. And get those visuals and convince them to do it. And then you start on that price reduction on day one. Because we all know that once that thing hits the market, one week later, what? We're already in trouble. Two weeks, we're really in trouble. By 30 days, we're running from the seller because we're scared. Okay, so go right at them, right from day one. Yeah, and, and what she's talking about is the trust that, that, that builds between you and the seller. You know, sellers want to trust who they're working with. You know, they, as you said, you know, many times, you know, an associate or realtor will get the listing and then they disappear and they don't hear from them literally for a month sometimes. And uh, and so when we, we get called on some of those and they say, well, gee, I only saw my realtor three times and they, they never brought anybody here. I mean, you know, we work so hard to get these listings. That's just the beginning of the work. And I mean, how nice it would be if they got a you know, they might get a phone call, but they get a text or something from you every couple of three days to say, hey, you know, we had showings, we didn't have anything, we need to look at the price again, you know, we've had people tell us that we think they're too high, we talked about the fact that maybe we were going in too high to begin with, so let's go back and relook at it again. You know, I tell our associates, when we have those discussions at the listing time, make sure you put it in writing, it, and an email is the best place to put it, so you can forward it back later on, and say, okay, I believe the value is this. We'll try your price for a while, but after you know a month, after a couple of months, we're gonna sit back down and talk again. And just put that in writing, it doesn't have to be forceful, just put it aside because they never remember what you told them. But when you can send that email back and say, remember when we listed 60 days ago? Well, now's the time that we really need to adjust it because we don't wanna get stale on the market. By the way, our responsibility on this is so huge that if you're the one that hasn't talked to your seller, just lay the groundwork. Say, listen, don't want to talk about pricing this week. I'll chat with you again next week. Lay the groundwork and, and then go in. And we have probably one of the most valuable tools available to us right now, which is video. Send them a video text. If you send an email to somebody or a text message, text messages used to be better when it wasn't I love you, which is I owe you. Or, you know, they used to be a little bit more personal. Not as effective now. Emails, they just get deleted. Do a short video, don't make it any more than 50 or 30 seconds, and give them the reality with your human face there, with your voice and your emotion. It's gonna get you a lot farther, and I promise you, 100% of text messages get read, so that video will be watched, as long as it's not too long. I think it's also important to remember that you're working with each other. And so I think one of the problems is that people come in to these listing presentations and they think that the person who says the highest price is gonna get the listing. And at the end, it's a crumbling system and then you wind up with wife number four or agent number six or whatever it is, which is a, a lose-lose. The, the creativity with collaboration is really endless. We just had a, a beautiful experience on the development side where this chat has been created organically by agents all of the development in-house agents. And um, yesterday, we had an open house that was promoted by every in-house agent in every project in the neighborhood, and it yielded unbelievable success for everyone. So if you collaborate, everybody wins. And it's a, a matter of friendly competition and raising the bar instead of beating it down by beating each other. In terms of those pricing conversations, is it harder to have that discussion with a, 
a resale seller or with a developer? You've been working on different... I think developers. anybody in this room that has ever talked to a developer can answer that question, hands down, a developer. Because the more that's on the table, the harder the conversation. And I always, I call them the big boys because they are mostly boys. And those guys have more than their shirt on the line. They have everything on the line. So those pricing conversations are very difficult. You know, I just want to jump in here too. These developers made a decision to come to our city. They put all this money into our city because they believed in our city. We all have a responsibility to get these sold. So you've got to make sure you put them in the mix. You have to visit them. You have to get to know them. You need that material. You need all of those drop boxes full of that information. We've got to sell them. We've got a responsibility to them. We have time for one more question, and I want to ask a tougher one. Um, obviously, it's been in the news lately, sexual harassment in Hollywood. Um, is, is that something that is an issue in, in real estate? And, and should anything be done about it? <laughs> you know, it, um, I'm, I'm getting to a point where um, we've been through it all, right? You know, <laughs> I was going to say, I'm going to save it for the news because apparently we get a lot of press. <laughs> uh, so, look, it's an interesting phenomenon, and um, it's a delicate balancing act. And I think that for, for the women in the room, um, I doubt there's, I don't know, in my experience anyway, I doubt there's a woman in the room that at some point has not experienced either harassment or discrimination by nature of being a woman. And, you know, I've never been a bra burner, I never thought about it much, but every now and then something happens and it sets you back a bit. I, I coincidentally had something happen last week, and quite frankly, at my age, it's pretty bizarre. And um, I was like, really? Should I be feeling good about this or what? You know? So, um, did you feel good about it or? You know, I have to tell you, it was very disconcerting because I felt silly. Because at my age, I felt silly. I was like, what does this guy think? I'm not gonna hire him, you know? It was very, but it was very disconcerting. I think more disconcerting now than when I was younger and I was just like, you don't have a prayer buddy. You know, so it was a very weird thing. But as a woman, I would tell you all that it doesn't matter. It just, it really doesn't matter. You are who you are. You're gonna stand your ground the way you think you should stand your ground. And it doesn't matter how they wanna treat you, it's how you're gonna to respond to that treatment. And basically, I've many times looked at guys and said, would your mom be proud of you right now? That works pretty well. I think what's really... Yeah. I think what's really important is that you have the courage to report. You have to report it because the behavior doesn't stop if people don't get stopped in their tracks. So have the courage to do that. And on the same lines, safety, realtor safety is very important. Don't be meeting people for the first time in, in empty houses. Houses have video and audio. You know, if you have to put a sticker on the outside of the door that says video and audio inside, you know, anything you need to do to protect yourself. And that goes for men and women alike. You know, sometimes we just go out there in the heat of the moment, we get so excited, make sure someone knows who you are. Even if you have to do a fake phone call from your cell and say, you know, hi Nancy, I'm standing outside at one, two, three, out on the street, and I'll be in here for about maybe 15, 20 minutes. I'll call you when I get out. Yeah, no, he's about six feet tall and you know and his name is such and such may I see your driver's license whatever you need to do to protect yourself you know you need to be smart about it. it's a big city I think the concentration of power and the platform that was established in Hollywood is disgusting and I think what has happened in Hollywood is despicable and I hope and pray that our industry will not be fraught with that level of disgust and disrespect and, and, and tragedy um, I, I can only imagine that both men and women are, are empowered by these leaders and the people that came before them um, to be strong and to be uh, firm in the, in the opportunities that they have in front of them and to avoid uh, the nastiness that we've seen in Hollywood. I think, I think it's up to our leaders in the industry to set the, set the tone, set the right example, you know, be very professional. I mean, you know, I think our industry is a very professional industry. I mean, it's a licensed industry. Uh, some people try to you know, not make it so professional, but I think it's up to the leaders you know, to call those people down when you see that happening. I mean, we've talked about a lot of people from the outside, but there are people on the inside that create problems too. So, you know, I think the, you know, the model that the leadership sets is what really sets the standard. Well, obviously a huge issue today. And uh, I want to end it there and thank you guys. You were great. Thank you, audience, too.